In 1789, the HMS Bounty became famous, not for its intended mission, but for the dramatic mutiny led by Fletcher Christian against Captain William Bly. The mutineers wanted the, we'll call it, idyllic life that they had experienced in one of their stop-offs in Tahiti. And they chose to rebel against their leader, who had very high expectations for his crew, being a naval captain, obviously. So this story of mutiny displays a stark betrayal of loyalty and duty, and it echoes the challenges that were faced by the church in Thyatira, which we're going to talk about in today's Bible study. In Thyatira, they were seduced by the teachings and the rituals of someone Jesus nicknames Jezebel. Kind of sends shivers down your spine, right? This Jezebel was a figure leading them astray and causing them to, in a sense, mutiny against their Lord. So we're going to look at that. I'd like to say welcome to Free Grace Bible Study. I'm Lucas Kitchen. And I'm Krista Kitchen. We work with Free Grace International, the organization that brings you this very Bible study. We're very excited that you're with us. Now, I know that some folks who are listening might want to lead a small group or even a church through this Bible study. If that's um, something they want to do, how can they do that? If you would like to lead a group through this Bible study, you can go to the page for this podcast on our website. You can get to that page by going to freegrace.in slash rev2d. Good. So can you give us just a little bit of a description of what's going to take place in this episode? We're looking at a message to a church that was doing a lot of things, right, but had a big problem with allowing bad influences like Jezebel to lead them astray. Jesus praises their good works, but warns them about the bad and talks about the need for change. He talks about the importance of staying true to what's right and promises a special closeness with him for those who do. Okay, well, let's get right to our passage. Can you uh, read that for us? Sure. Our passage for today is Revelation 2, 18 through 29. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write... These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works." Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, and as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come, and he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also have received from my father and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Wow, there's there's quite a bit to think about there. So let's dig in. Let's start with verse 18 of chapter 2. Can you read that one more time so we're kind of on the same page here? Verse 18 says... And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. So in verse 18, he calls himself the Son of God, which shows his power and his divinity. 
And that's a little bit different than the names he's used so far. He's talked about being the one who holds the seven stars and being the one who was dead and has come back to life. Uh, in this part, his eyes are also flaming, which we saw way back in chapter one. And you'll probably notice that in each of his addresses to the seven churches, he references something that we saw in chapter one when John um, saw his um, his amazing appearance. So these uh, flaming eyes and these brass glowing feet, they show both his power, but also the fact that he sees everything. He's got this amazing vision that penetrates even down to the heart. So this starts to prepare us and we'll say the believers at Thyatira for the criticism that they're about to receive. So let's look at verse 19. Verse 19 says, I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Okay, so Jesus sees the good in the Thyatira church, just like he did with Ephesus in Revelation 2. But instead of critiquing them like he did Ephesus for losing their first love, he's happy with them. He's happy with Thyatira. Their zeal is even stronger than before. So they're kind of opposite in a way. Their their zeal is growing. Their faith is getting deeper. And that's shown because they have more love, they have more service, they have more faith and patience. So things are going really well. But verse 20 turns a little bit. Let's see what that says. Verse 20. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Whoa, so Jesus calls out what he says, that woman Jezebel, reminding us of the Old Testament Jezebel who led Israel astray. She led Israel into this time of idol worship, and as far as we know, there was this rash of pagan sex rituals that came along with that. You can you can see that um, bared out in 1 Kings 16.31 and chapter 21, verse 25. So Jezebel as a name is probably a nickname Jesus gave to an actual woman in the church there in Thyatira. And she was named that by Jesus, we think, because she was leading this pagan sex cult among the believers. She also claimed to be a prophetess. Now, it's hard to believe that the church didn't have the ability to shut this down. And the simple fact is they did have the ability, but they, for whatever reason, chose to ignore it. And I think we see this in churches a lot of times. It's easier to not deal with problems, to not have those direct conversations. But Jesus is going to show us that he has high expectations that we do that. So this lesson from Thyatira is a heads up for all Christians. It shows how temptation can sneak into the church. And a lot of times temptation follows bad teaching. So bad teaching opens the door and then that temptation walks right through it. So we have to be on our guard. Let's take a look at that next verse. Verse 21 says, And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. So Jesus did extend grace before judgment. It says he gave her time to repent. Now, repentance in this context is about her behavior. It's not a reference to whether or not she is saved. She might be saved. She might not be. We know that saved people can fall into temptation and sin, even really bad stuff. Uh, So she may be saved. She may not be saved. It doesn't actually tell us. So I'll just remind you, salvation is a gift received through faith. But repentance, at least in this context, is a change in behavior. He's expecting her behavior and we'll also say her teaching to change. So if Jezebel was an unbeliever, her repentance and her saving faith are both needed, but they're two separate things. If she was a believer, she must repent to get back on track with Christ. Either way, Jesus insists on change, and that's what he's pressing for here. 2.22, Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. He will cast Jezebel into a sick bed. So Jesus uses real world circumstances to bring about change, the change that he requires. So this judgment is for her, 
but also for any who have participated in her sins. You see, sin is contagious in a local church, uh, but not all is lost here since he says that he would discipline them unless they repent of their deeds. This is why we know that in this context, repentance means a change of behavior, because if they changed their mind but kept doing their deeds, like if they agreed that, yeah, these deeds are bad, but we're going to keep doing them, then here that wouldn't qualify as repentance. So this repentance is definitely a change of behavior. So repentance is the key to averting God's discipline in this life. And that's true for both believers and unbelievers, actually. So as we said in the last verse, we don't know if these are believers, but we assume they are because they're part of the church, and the church is made up of believers. So it seems that these are believers that have gotten off track, they've fallen into temptation, and they need to repent, or Jesus is going to cast Jezebel and potentially others into some type of sickness. So while Jesus is patient, his call to repentance is incredibly urgent. I mean, he is really serious here. He aims to restore believers and the entire church to purity. So obviously, not all of your life's troubles are God's judgment. It's important that we say that. I mean, if you're facing trouble, not everything that is difficult in your life is God's judgment. But when we're facing trouble, we should remember that sometimes God uses what seems like very natural circumstances to get our attention and to get us to turn from sin. So it's valuable to pray about that when you face trouble, is to just ask God, hey, Lord, am I potentially in sin here? Are you trying to teach me something? Okay, let's take a look at that next verse. 223, I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Okay, so there's there's three things in here that I want to I want to break apart. I want to break this into three parts. So first, I want to look at the phrase, I will kill her children with death. This shows how severe Jesus' judgment is on those that have gotten off track and especially have gotten into this pagan, idol-worshiping, sex cult type of stuff. I mean, this is a, this is a mess. So it targets those who keep on sinning. And this shows how God seriously views unrepentant believers, especially those in sexual sin. And now, we may not have churches full of people worshiping idols today, but we do have churches that are full of sexual sin. Everything from sex outside of marriage to homosexual or non-normative sexual relationships up to adultery. So we have lots of sexual sin in our churches today, and I think that the Lord still views it the same way, very severely. So sometimes in these cases— God might end believers' lives. I mean, notice, he says, I will kill her children with death. He's saying that he might end their lives. He does this for the purpose of discipline or to stop the sin, both for the individual believer, but also to purify the church because he loves his church and he knows how much this can corrupt the mission and the goal of the church. Now, you can find out more about times when God disciplines and even cuts believers' lives short in 1 Corinthians 11, 30 and Acts 5, 1 through 11. But this does not mean, note this, this does not mean that they lose their salvation. This is talking about their physical life being cut short. But Scripture says unequivocally that salvation is forever once you believe in Jesus, we can see that in John 10, 28, 29, Romans 8, 38, and 39, and, and, and lots of other verses. Once saved, always saved. He is not saying that they're going to lose their salvation, but they might lose their physical life. They might have their life cut short if they don't repent, if they don't turn. Now, the next part of this verse that I want to break apart is the part where it says, All the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. This shows God knows everything. He can see our true motives. Uh, there are lots of verses that talk about that. It also shows God wants to reveal his character. And you may remember, as if, if you've read the Old Testament, that throughout the Old Testament, God did things so that people 
among the nations would know that he is the Lord. We have lots of examples of that in like Exodus and First Kings and Ezekiel and other places. So God wants people to know that he is God. And sometimes what he does is he judges his people. He disciplines his people. And that shows that he is active, that he is uh, that he is a, discipl- a God who disciplines and that he is still um, active in believers' lives. So the third part that I want to look at this first, the break apart, is the part where he says, I will give to each one of you according to your works. This is very important that we don't mix this up with salvation, but it's a very important verse. It means that Jesus will repay us based on what we do. Now, you've probably heard that salvation is a free gift, and it is not based on what we do, and that's absolutely right. Salvation comes from faith, not works. We can see that in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. But we will face judgment for how we lived. Now, I use that word judgment a a little bit loosely because it's the judgment seat of Christ, not the white throne judgment, which we find at the end of Revelation. It's not a judgment to determine whether we go to heaven or hell, it's a judgment to determine if we rec- what what eternal reward we receive. We can see that in in verses like 2 Corinthians 5:10, Romans 14:10 and 12, and 1 Corinthians 3:13 through 15. All of those talk about reward, and the first two talk about the judgment seat of Christ, this moment where we're going to give an account of our life. So, this shows the balance of grace and responsibility. So salvation is a gift, yet we will be rewarded based on how we use that gift. 2 24. Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden. Verse 25. But hold fast what you have till I come. So as we already said, it looks like this person with the nickname Jezebel had started some kind of pagan sex cult within the church. Jesus says her followers knew the depths of Satan. Another translation says the deep things of Satan. I mean, what a terrible thing to have said about your small group. Can you imagine? However, not everyone in the church was involved. Some in the church resisted Jezebel's evil and occultic leadership. So for those who resisted, Jesus gives this encouragement to hold fast what you have till I come. He encourages the faithful to persevere in their commitment. They were to hold fast to good doctrine and godly behavior. And in so doing, they were metaphorically holding fast to the reward he would give them in exchange when he arrives. You remember at the end of Revelation, he's going to say, behold, I come quickly and I've got my reward with me and I want to give it to you based on how you've performed, based on whether or not you have overcome the temptations that you face. So he's going to talk about that reward in the next verse. 226. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. So the concept of being an overcomer goes beyond the mere act of being saved, right? The the saved are not expected to be passive while waiting for life to pass, right? We are called to a life of victory, spiritual warfare, and striving for triumph in our walk with Christ. He tells them, but also us, by the way, to overcome and keep my works until the end. Those who do will be granted the authority to rule with Christ in his future kingdom. Now, there's other places where it talks about ruling with Christ, like Romans 8, 37, 2 Timothy 2, 12, which I love, and Revelation 26. 2, 27. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels as I also have received from my Father. So Jesus quotes Psalms 2, 9 here. And if you're not familiar with it, it's where that rod of iron concept comes from. It shows the authority that will be granted to the overcomers. So this imagery of ruling with a rod of iron and dashing nations to pieces like the potter's vessel, it 
tells of the absolute authority Christ and his followers, his, uh, I guess we should say his faithful followers, will exercise in the millennial kingdom. Now, we often think of Jesus having that authority, but it's easy for us to slip our minds that we will rule on his behalf, and therefore we too will be ruling with a rod of iron. And that brings up a lot of questions about what that will look like, what that will mean. But nonetheless, he says it. So this will be part of that amazing reward for those who are faithful to Christ's call to overcome. Those who overcome the temptations and the challenges that they face, even within their own church, in the case of these believers in Thyatira, they will be given this reward to rule in Christ's iron-fisted kingdom. How cool is that? 228, and I will give him the morning star. He promises the morning star to those who overcome. So those who overcome the temptations that they're facing, and they do the works until the end of their life, the works of Christ, they're going to get something called the morning star. Now, this sounds like it might be a a sci-fi movie or maybe a fantasy movie. I mean, it sounds like a mystery at first, right? But It's cleared up when we get to a later chapter in the book of Revelation. Jesus will later explain that he himself is the bright and morning star. Wow, that's Revelation 22, 16. I mean, it's amazing. What what he's saying is that he himself is the reward. This eternal reward is given not to all believers, but to those who finish well, to those who stick with it, to those who overcome the temptations they face, they do the works until the end. It represents a privileged closeness to Jesus in the coming kingdom. I mean, just imagine this, that you have the king of the world and therefore the universe on speed dial. You can call him up. You can go hang out with him. You can you can eat with him. You can spend time with him. It's amazing. And it is a reminder that not all believers are going to have this privilege at the same level. All believers will be with Christ, generally speaking, but here he's showing that those who overcome those temptations and keep the works until the end, they're going to have this privileged closeness with Jesus the King. It's similar and kind of a reminder of the promise God made to Abraham in Genesis 15. Do you remember that one? God said, He himself is Abraham's exceedingly great reward. So we get the sense here that the essence of eternal reward is actually closeness to Christ. So the promise of the morning star in this verse is to overcomers. And it proves that the greatest treasure believers can attain is an intimate relationship with Christ. And it's reserved for those who pursue victory during their lives. Verse 29, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So if you can hear what's being said to Thyatira, and I'm assuming you can since you're listening to this podcast episode, as anyone can hear, then they can learn from this. It's like if you have an ear on the side of your head, or even if you just have a hole where sound goes in, you can learn from this. This is not just for Thyatira. This is for anybody that can understand and take it in. It reminds us to fight to overcome the temptations we face because the reward in Jesus' kingdom will be amazing. Here are some discussion questions to help you think about the content. Feel free to pause the recording between each question to consider or discuss if you happen to be leading a group. Okay, here's the first one. How does the title Son of God, used in Revelation 2, 18, enhance our understanding of Jesus' authority and deity compared to the other titles mentioned previously? In Revelation 2, 19, what does the progression of the Thyatira church's work suggest about the nature of spiritual growth and maturity? How do the actions and teachings of Jezebel in Revelation 2.20 reflect the dangers of integrating pagan practices into Christian life?
What does Revelation 2, 21 teach us about the nature of repentance and its significance in both believers and non-believers' lives? In light of Revelation 2.22, how can communal responsibility and the nature of sin's consequences impact a church community? What does the severe judgment mentioned in Revelation 2.23 reveal about God's stance on persistent sin within his people? How does Revelation 2.23 demonstrate God's omniscience and the purpose behind his judgments? Considering Revelation 2.24 through 25, why is resisting false teaching and immoral behaviors crucial for a believer's spiritual health and witness? How does Revelation 2.26 challenge the concept of passivity in a believer's life post-salvation? What does the imagery of ruling with a rod of iron in Revelation 2.27 signify about the authority given to overcomers? In Revelation 2.28, how does the promise of the morning star symbolize the ultimate reward of closeness with Christ for those who overcome? Revelation 2.29 extends an invitation to all believers. How does this underscore the universal relevance and urgency of the message of the seven churches? Okay, that's all the discussion questions we have for this Bible study session. Uh, One last reminder. Uh, Can you remind them of what they can get on the website? If you would like to lead a group through this Bible study, take a look at our website where you can find all of the content of this podcast in written form. We want to give you tools to help your friends, family, small group, or church to grow. You can find that and more at our website, which is freegrace.in. You can subscribe to the website to get updates and future releases. Very cool. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back with you sometime soon.